Ephesians chapter 4. I want to continue on with last week. We're moving through the book of Ephesians. And as you're turning there, I just want to pray to the Lord. Father, I pray this morning that we would not look at anyone else, but Lord, um, that your Holy Spirit would direct our thoughts and our attention to our own lives, to our own hearts, to our own patterns of behavior, Lord, because our desire needs to be to be like you. And Lord, when we emulate you, when we imitate you, your son, Lord, we are in your presence. And Lord, I pray that you would grow us up in the faith, grow us up in the faith even this year. But Lord, we need your help this morning. We need your Holy Spirit to illuminate our own hearts and our own lives. Lord, because so many times uh, our own sin is, uh, we're blind to it, Lord. The insidious nature of sin, our own self and our own lives, Lord, it's hard for us to see. So Lord, we just depend on your Holy Spirit. May this message be greater than the messenger. And Lord, bless your people through your word this morning. So, so I just want to, uh, in Jesus' name, Amen. I just want to get to uh, read through this text to remind us of what we saw last week. And a quick reminder, when we look at Ephesians 4, this is the primary text in the New Testament on the church. You want to know what the strategy, what the mission of the church is, how the church is supposed to operate, how it's, how it's supposed to function? We look at Ephesians 4. Just because we have a sign on a building and it says church on it doesn't mean that that facility is functioning as a church. We need to look to the New Testament and let that be our standard, let that be our guide. So let's begin reading. Uh, <clears throat> we'll just take it up in verse, in verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 4. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to what? To equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of who? Of Christ then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part as each part does its own special work it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love now a church that's operating that way is a place you want to be at Amen. that's a people you want to be at when everybody's speaking the truth in love in maturity to each other when everybody's serving in their own special way and to build up one another, to build up the body, that's the church you want to be at. That's the church you want to be in, and that is God's mission and purpose for the church. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Do you notice it says each one? It's not just the pastor. It's not just the worship team. Each one is a member of the body of Christ. Each of you have something to contribute. Each of you have a gift or spiritual gifts, a bundle of gifts to be used to build up other people in the church. So if we wanted to summarize that passage <clears throat> and let that passage determine what our mission is for our church, it would be something like this. Jesus gives gifts to the church so that through the preaching of the word, Christians are equipped to use their spiritual gifts resulting in what? Resulting in maturity and the building up of the church. That's the mission. So notice the five gifts, as we said last week, each of those have to do with the proclamation of the word of God. When you see the word, the terms apostolic tradition in your New Testament, that apostolic tradition was an oral tradition. It was a preaching. They were given authority to proclaim God's word. That tradition is eventually what, what became our New Testament. So the apostles think for us today, that in large part, that's the New Testament for us. 
That is the authority. And, and, and prophets, of course, they're declaring the word of the Lord, declaring the word of God. Evangelists, they're giving the gospel through proclamation. Pastors and teachers. Notice how the emphasis, the thing that drives, draw, uh, draws all five of those things together is the word of God. And I have to say, without the word of God, you personally getting in the word yourselves, coming under the preaching of the word of God yourself, maturity is not likely to happen, cannot happen, I, I would say. The word of God is, is crucial, it's vital. It's the living word of God. So I would ask you, how's your Bible reading going for 2016? If you've, if you've already uh, lost traction, lost momentum, hey, get back. Uh, and I definitely want to recommend The Bible Project. You can go to thebibleproject.com and, and go to YouTube channel. It has videos, amazing, animated, uh, very artistic, creatively done videos that go with each major book of the Bible that tells you the big picture, the meta narrative of that book. And you can begin to pick up the themes of the whole book so that when you read through the book, you start to see how it goes together. You know, we're talking about maturity and immaturity this morning. And I'll just say this as an extra or an aside, that um, immaturity, we can exercise immaturity in our Bible reading. Now, the immaturity can look like this. It can be, hey, I don't read my Bible very often. But your immaturity in your Bible reading can also be, when I read the Bible, it's, it's a passage here, it's a passage there. I pick out a verse and I meditate on that. That's good. That's a great place to start. And I'm not trying to, to completely minimize that. But as you grow in your maturity, you want to get to the place where you're going through whole books of the Bible at a time. And so that even when you're not understanding all that's going on, you keep reading because you're looking for the overarching storyline. Some of you would be surprised to find that as you read through the Gospels, an event you thought took place once is actually taking place four or five times because Jesus intentionally is doing the same thing. For instance, healing on the Sabbath or doing some work or miracle on the Sabbath. You would find out, hey, there's repetition there. Why does Jesus continually persist on offending the religious leaders? So when you start to put together whole books, some of those passages that didn't quite make sense to you, once you connect them with the overarching whole, they begin to take on new meaning. And you see that much like any writer of a novel or something has an overarching storyline, the writers of the New Testament books do as well. One of the primary things that connects all the books of the New Testament is they go back directly or very much um, through one other person directly back to the apostles in the apostolic tradition. That's really what connects all the, the, bi, uh, the books of the New Testament, is that apostolic tradition. And that's why it's important that it was written in the first century, because the, they had to have direct access to Jesus. The apostles, if you, if you understand that, when you, a lot of things the apostles say in writing these books, um, either directly or through what we call an amanuensis, someone that took it down for them, much like the Gospel of Mark, who is, is pretty much the Gospel of Peter, it's, they're, they're saying, hey, we were with Jesus, we were with him directly. We saw him. We, we, we lived with him. And therein, they were sent out, and that's what apostle means, a sent out one. They were sent out by Jesus to represent Jesus and to guide the church. And the reason why the apostles were given in initiating these churches is because the churches were so susceptible to deception. And you see that in our text. Then we won't be deceived, right? We won't be tricked, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Because that, the, the Ephesian uh, church that Paul is writing to, do they have the New Testament? So we should be grateful for that. Because you imagine back in a day when they didn't have the internet and they didn't have uh, telephones and they didn't have airplanes and they didn't have automobiles. I mean, and yet, it isn't amazing how the church was able to, to grow all around the, the Western world at that time and around the Mediterranean. Isn't it amazing what was accomplished merely through writing things down and passing it on? And so because, for instance, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says this. He says, you took our preaching essentially as for what it really was, the word of God. The apostles were, were recognized that the, what they were preaching and what they were writing down was directly from, from God himself. <clears throat> and because they recognized that, <clears throat> And the church later recognized that the, the, the preaching and the writing the apostles had had authority today. So if someone claims to be an apostle today, the question I would ask them, and of course there's really different levels of apostle, I'm talking about the formal office of apostle, you, I would ask them today, does what you preach and what you write have the same authority as the New Testament? Now that's quite a question, isn't it? 
But as we move forward, we see that the preaching of the Word of God is essential. That's, all, that's what I want you to know this morning. The preaching of the Word of God is essential. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas about what the church is and what Christianity is. And in large part, the reason for that is because there's a lot of wacky ideas about what the church should be and how, what it should do and how it should spend its resources. There's a lot of wacky ideas out there, aren't there? And a lot of people will claim to be a Christian, but yet are very ignorant towards what the Scripture really teaches. Now, I'm not trying to say, hey, we're better than them and uh, everybody else is messed up and we're great. I'm saying, hey, let's not let that be guilty of us as a church. Let's get into the Word. Let's actually know what we believe and then guess what? Practice it. Because that's really, the idea of practicing it is getting into the idea of becoming Christian uh, mature. The idea of practicing, that's where we're going to get this morning. That's what I want to talk to you this morning about is uh, maturity versus immaturity. And uh, I wanted to do that last week, and we're going to hopefully get through this this morning. But you imagine... It's still possible today. It, it was possible for, for Christians to be deceived and tricked back then. Without all the modern technology we have today, it is still possible for Christians to be deceived and tricked, even in, in our age, in our time. And part of the way that we can be deceived is through what? Self-deception. Through self-deception. And so I, I just want to challenge us this morning. Some of us may have the idea that, is that, hey, I'm mature in the Lord, and I'm here to let you know. Um, other people may feel this way, hey, I'm, I don't know anything. I'm immature, and I feel like I'm always going to be that way. And I really want to speak to both groups, both, both uh, people, uh, groups feeling that way, those two kind of ways. So the first thing I want to cover this morning is what um, spiritual maturity is not. What spiritual maturity is not. Are we interested in being spiritually mature? Is it okay to remain spiritually mature? Now, Jesus is patient, isn't he? And he's kind, and he's compassionate. But you remember that story about um, that, that fig tree? You remember that story? Um, he's passing by a fig tree. It's not producing any fruit. And Jesus is telling the story. And Jesus, his heart is, hey, that, that tree is not producing any fruit. Tear it down. Jesus? Really? And what does the servant say? Hey, look it. I'm going to dig it back up. I'm going to re-fertilize it, whatever, and give it another year. And if in a year's time it doesn't produce fruit, then tear it down. And I, and I look at that to challenge myself, and I say, you know what? I need to be producing fruit in my life. That's what Jesus' desire is for me. Jesus Christ should not get up on a cross and die for my sin just so I can continue in my sin. He wants us to mature. And believe me, there's so many blessings in maturity. Maturity is one of those intangible things you can't see, right? And I like to describe it this way. If we go to, say, neighborhoods around here like uh, West Bloomfield and Birmingham, we're going to see some amazing homes, right? And we're going to see some amazing automobiles sitting in the driveways of those amazing homes, right? And we're also going to see some amazing church buildings, some amazing architecture that way. I saw one recently that was uh, beautiful. And so when you're seeing those beautiful homes, let's say you're seeing multi-million dollar homes, that's something you can see, right? It's concrete. It's tangible. You can take a picture of it. Education, maturity, things like this, they are intangible. You can't really see it. And that means you really can't understand it until you have it. And so if you don't have it, it's hard for you sometimes to grasp what it is you're missing. Because it's hard to get your head wrapped around it. And I just want to challenge you that you want to, if you don't this morning, you should desire Christian maturity. It's a beautiful thing, and it trickles out into every area and facet of your life. And here's the thing, it affects not only you, but it affects your whole family tree. And it affects not only you, but it affects your whole church. And it affects not only you, but it trickles out into your community as well. Do people outside the church need to see what Christian maturity looks like? Is it sadly the case that often what they see um, and what we find on the news often is not Christian maturity? When we take these ideas of what spiritual and Christian maturity is and we look at the presidential candidates, are we seeing maturity? Depends who you're looking at. So, hey, how about in this presidential election coming up, 
don't want to spend too much time here. We take biblical categories whereby to do an analysis of the presidential candidates. Now, that might be hard to do, huh? And there's a lot going to do there. But I'm saying, let's not always use the world's worldview or lens whereby to do an analysis on what's going to be good for us. But also, let's spend the time in our own. If they don't see it anywhere else, let it be known that they're going to see Christian maturity through our church and through us. And we may be the only Jesus they ever see. That is true. So, again, what spiritual maturity is not... And I said this last uh, last week briefly, I'll say it again. Just because you're accumulating more gray hair doesn't mean you're accumulating more maturity. Just because you have accumulated more years doesn't mean you have accumulated more wisdom and maturity. It's not a one-for-one. It's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily follow. Now, I'll say this. Just because you're um, growing old doesn't mean you're growing up. Isn't that sadly the case? So just because you've been a Christian a long time, it doesn't, I'm not saying you're not, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're, Christ, you're spiritually mature. Just like addictions to drugs and alcohol can hit the pause button on one's maturity and development, so accepted patterns of behavior expressed in response to conflict keep one from developing maturity. So for the addict, we could look at their bank account and their spending, but for the Christian, you want to you know if, if, what their maturity level is? You know what we need to look at? Their conflict resolution skills. How do they handle conflict? How do we handle conflict? How do I handle conflict? You want to cut to the chase? You want to look at my whole life and cut right to the chase? Look at how I respond when I'm, when I'm offended, when I'm wrong, when I'm, when I'm sinned against. You want to cut right to the chase? Look there. That's where we need to look at if we want to see where our Christian maturity is. That's one place. So, <clears throat> how you resolve conflict will tell you how mature you are. Now, does that hurt a little bit? Now, we're not thinking about the person next to us, right? The person behind us or the person in front of us. We're thinking about ourselves, right? I'm not here to point the finger. I mean, if I point at you, I got three fingers pointing back at me, right? So, each of us needs to think about ourselves because, really, we can't force anybody else to do anything, can we? I mean, you can hold them at gunpoint. But as soon as you take the gun away, they're going to go back to where they were. The, and that's why we're told often in Scripture that we're supposed to imitate God. Paul says, first, that's uh, Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate God. So the reason for that is because God is the sun, and he reflects out his glory, and we are the moon. And without his glory, we're just a hunk of dead rock with no light of our own, aren't we? But when we receive that light and we receive that glory and we shine it out into the world, we become very beautiful. A full moon on a clear night, right? How beautiful that is. And and other people seeing the glory reflected through us that is truly derived from him, they actually see something that's beautiful and they are attracted to it. And thereby, that is how we desire to affect change. And I'm telling you, that is a spiritual method because it is going to take the Holy Spirit working through you, filling you, in order for you to do that consistently over time. And that is Christian maturity. So how you resolve conflict. Each time we resort to anger or passive-aggressive behavior or codependency or anything like that, guess what we miss out on? We miss out on the opportunity to grow. We miss out on the opportunity to mature. See, I, and I, sadly I can say this from my own life, when, when you um, begin... You know, I I said I had seven years away from the Lord. Seven years. It was a four-year period followed directly by a three-year period. And during that time, I had hit the pause button on my maturity because of the the habits and and patterns of behavior that I was involved in. And so I was, what, 25 when I met my wife. And you wonder why I'm eight and a half years older than her. And there's a certain, there's a sense in which part of that is God's grace in my life because I'm about the same, I was about the same mature level she was already at when I met her. That's hard to admit a little bit, isn't it? But because every time conflict came in my life, I ran. And instead of facing it and allowing that hard situation to develop maturity in me, develop character in me, develop fortitude in me, I ran the other way. And so my maturity level was literally placed on pause. When this maturity level gets placed on pause, it sometimes has evidence that you can actually see 
uh, ex- on the exterior. The, you know, people that had their maturity, maybe they, they got involved in addiction like I did when I was in high school. And 10 years later, they're talking the same. They are literally dressing the exact same as when they first started those patterns of behavior. Their vocabulary, their dress, their mannerisms, their acting. And so you're talking to a 30-year-old, but if you look carefully, you might realize you're actually talking to a 16-year-old. So there's, I want to say that's not just for the addict. That's also for us. If we're not handling things in a biblical way, in a spiritual way, we are missing out on opportunities for character, for maturity to be developed in our own lives. If we're not exhibiting and seeking and desiring greatly for what we find in the Word of God to be demonstrated and lived out and expressed through our own lives, we're missing out on opportunities to develop maturity in our own life. So you've heard it said, you can't uh, teach an old dog new tricks, right? Is that true? Not necessarily, is it? But it can be true, can it? And sadly, too often, it, it's too true. Now, I'm starting to see this because I just turned 40, and I'm starting to realize, hey, some of those things I used to want to do really badly, I don't really want to do as much anymore, like jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. With a parachute. And my wife said, hey, aren't you going to do that? You wanted to do that? And in fact, my wife bought me an opportunity to do that, a group hunt or something, and it's like I still haven't even used it. And you know, it's because you're, you know, your desires change <laughs> as you grow older. But your desires can change, and that's development, that's maturity, but that's good. But sometimes we can get settled into our own ways, right? Instead of growing older, meaning we're developing more maturity, it can mean we're just getting more settled in our ways. <clears throat> Saying things like, hey, that's just who I am. That's just my personality. Uh, shows that we're justifying our sin and have given up on the, str- on the struggle for maturity. We say, hey, that's not sin. That's just my personality. That's just who I am. That is someone who's given up. Because maturity says, is, is humble enough to say, you know what? That is part of my personality now, but I can see the parts of that personality that are sinful because they don't look like Jesus. And I've had those, exhibited those for maybe 20, 40 years now, and I need to be willing to give them up. Hey, the way you thought in 2015 does not have to be the way you think in 2016. You cannot say things like, hey, that's just the way we've always done it. It's not a good enough reason. That's true on an individual level, and it's also true on the church level, community level. Just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean you have to keep doing it that way. There's always hope for change. And I, and I hope you, you, um, you receive that as hope and as encouragement. So, <clears throat> When growing older doesn't mean growing wise and growing in maturity, do you know who takes the biggest hit, oftentimes? It's the generation that follows. Because growing up should mean, mean growing wise and growing in maturity, and who needs that wisdom and that maturity? The generations that follow. Amen. And see, and that's God's design, isn't it? So, um, what happens when grandfathers are not grand? And great-grandfathers are not great. Immaturity and the lack of wisdom become systemic, perpetual, and embedded in one's family tree. And I'm saying, I saw, my point here is, um, <laughs> you need maturity, but it's not just you. It's your family tree needs you to be mature. They need to know what that looks like. I often tell young people, look, you don't have to learn the hard way like I did, beating my head against the wall, the brick wall, you can actually, because you've heard the statement, I like the statement, Maybe I made it, made it before, it says that um, knowledge is learning from your mistakes and wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. Can, can, can we become mature and wise so the generations that follow, the young people in our church and in our families can actually take all the wisdom we've had that maybe took us 40 years to get and we can give it to them in a matter of years? You, you, don't you want to give the generation that follows every advantage you possibly can? Every, don't parents like to do that? Absolutely, you, we do. It's, it, and it's motivated by love, and it's a beautiful thing, and that's God's design. So grown men and women acting like children is all too common in our society, and sadly can be common even in the church. And as I said, there's a difference between growing old and growing up. They're not a one-for-one one necessarily. Now, I have a quote for you that kind of captures everything I just said by Dostoevsky. And it's, it's a little bit convoluted, so just bear with me, okay? I might need to read this twice, my wife said. Dostoevsky, in his uh, White Knights and Other Stories, he was a, a Russian writer. 
For after all, you do grow up. You do outgrow your ideals, which turn to dust and ashes, which are shattered into fragments. And if you have no other life, you just have to build one up out of these fragments. And all the time, your soul is craving and longing for something else. And in vain does the dreamer rummage about in his old dreams, raking them over as though they were a heap of cinders, looking in these cinders for some spark, however tiny, to fan it into a flame so as to warm his chilled blood by it and revive in it all that he held so dear before, all that touched his heart and made his blood course through his veins, that drew tears from his eyes and that so splendidly deceived him. Sometimes we need to give up our immaturity of days gone by and press on to say, you know what? I'm no longer going to be satisfied with that because that is not satisfying my soul. And I need to move on to a new and improve me, not just for my good, but for the good of the following generations after me. So first point is spiritual maturity is not necessarily um, age. Second one is growing in knowledge. Even biblical knowledge does not necessarily mean growing in maturity. You get that one? Just because you have a lot of knowledge or a lot of biblical knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that you're mature. Now, this can be a problem for seminary because when we graduate from seminary, we know a lot about the Bible. But that doesn't mean we're very mature. And sadly, one of the primary ways that churches evaluate a new pastoral candidate is merely through biblical knowledge. But they don't have a previous or prior relationship with him, and oftentimes it is the case they get a guy with the master's degree or they get the guy even with the doctorate, and it comes in and a church split happens. And people are hurt in, not for good reasons, but for destructive reasons, because of pride and because of arrogance, and because of using the pulpit as a weapon to beat people over the head Sadly, that is often too, too much the case. But gaining knowledge is valuable. We, just, we already said that. Preaching of the Word of God, it is valuable. But it is only in the application of that knowledge to our own lives that we gain maturity. You can know all about forgiveness, but until you are willing to forgive, you do not understand forgiveness. Amen. And you're still immature. So knowing forgiveness and understanding forgiveness, we'll draw a distinction there in our categories, okay? That just knowing about it is not sufficient. Bible study can be largely what? An intellectual exercise that leaves the life unchanged, sadly. And this is um, largely why, in case you weren't here before, in case you don't know, um, the fact that Bible study can be largely an intellectual exercise that leaves life unchanged. This is one of, just one of, the primary reasons we switch from Bible study to community groups. And I can say more on that later privately if you'd like to understand. By the way, if you're a guest, we have community groups that meet throughout the week. Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays currently. And if you're interested, please come see me or anybody that looks like they know what's going on right here. (laughs) Okay? Happy to share that. Um, We love community around here because it's how we do life together and it's how we, we encourage each other, to sharpen each other, to, to, to grow in our maturity. Which means kind of letting people into our lives, which kind of can be kind of scary. But hey, we don't force you to do that on the, second night, on the first night. Second. Maybe the second. No, we give you time. We're patient, just like Jesus. So knowledge that does not lead to more humility and maturity, guess what it leads to? Exactly. Thank you very much, Mary. It leads to more pride and arrogance. Do you see how it's a double-edged sword? Cuts both ways. So knowledge can lead to more maturity, but it can also lead to more pride and arrogance, right? Because Proverbs says knowledge puffeth up. Puffs up. Big puffy head walking around, right? I'm puffy. I'm I'm knowledgeable. But hey, I'm just full of pride, really. So um, knowledge that leads to pride, that does not lead to more maturity, but becoming... um, Knowledge that leads to pride does not lead to more maturity. And it leads to becoming more unteachable, and guess what, can actually solidify or cement one in their immaturity. Hey, I know so much, you can't tell me nothing. I already know, I already know. Is that maturity or immaturity? Immaturity. 
So it's not how much we know so much as it's how much we apply and how much we obey what we know that will develop maturity in our lives. It's one thing to know something, but to seek to obey it, guess what? That's when it gets hard. And when you persist in that hard thing, that is exactly how maturity is developed. Okay? So we shouldn't be scared of conflict. Conflict is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. An opportunity to grow and an opportunity to mature. So we don't have to run from conflict because guess who's got our back? Holy Spirit. Amen. And he wants to do a great work in our lives. And through this, we can develop fortitude, maturity, wisdom, and all those other beautiful things that look like Jesus. So, <coughs> remember, according to John 1 17, how did Jesus come? He came in grace and in truth. Truth without grace is immaturity and often displayed in young men who have truth but not enough maturity to speak that truth in love and we really need both and maturity it's maturity that says hey i'm going to speak the truth i got the truth i got knowledge but i'm going to speak that knowledge i'm going to speak that truth in grace in love that's maturity see the difference also i want us to know this maturity is um is not instantaneous it's not a click your heels together three times, you say a prayer, you go through a Bible study, you go through um, a book of the Bible, you read the whole Bible, and now you're mature. Hebrews 6.1 says this, if we pay attention to the nuances of the verbs there, let us continue progressing toward maturity. He did, the writer doesn't go on to say, except for those who have already arrived, you're, just stay where you're at. He's actually, that's, that's for everybody, to let us continue progressing in our maturity. Maturity realized there is always room to grow. The more mature you are, the more you realize you need to mature. Isn't that right? The more you know, the more you realize what you don't know. Thinking you have arrived is immaturity. Spiritual maturity does not result in your telling people you are mature. If you have to tell someone how mature, spiritual, humble, or knowledgeable you are, most likely you have some growing to do. So spiritual maturity is not instantaneous. Spiritual maturity is not equivalent to just gaining knowledge. And spiritual maturity is not uh, equivalent to just growing up or, or growing older. But also maturity, um, having spiritual, spiritual gifts and exercising those gifts is actually not equivalent to spiritual maturity. Just because hey, you have spiritual gifts and you use those gifts doesn't necessarily mean that you will be spiritually mature. Now, you can be moving in that direction, and when you begin to use your spiritual gifts, you're going to encounter conflict. You're going to encounter resistance. And through that, you're going to develop maturity. 1 Corinthians 1.7, Paul writes this. Now, now, you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes to that church in Corinth, you have every spiritual gift you need. He says two chapters later in 1 Corinthians 3, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. Now this is a spiritual people that have every spiritual gift. But he says, I couldn't talk to you like spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world, as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. And doesn't that prove that you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you, aren't you living like people of the world? So what we see from those two uh, texts put in juxtaposition is just because you have spiritual gifts does not necessarily mean you have spiritual maturity. Maturity is not the possession of gifts of the Spirit, but the production of the fruit of the Spirit. So we want to set up a difference, and we realize there's a difference between spiritual disciplines, spiritual gifts, and spiritual fruit. Galatians 5.22 Galatians 5.22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here's one, self-control. Now, what have we just described? Someone that exhibits that fruit is spiritually mature. 
That, those are the categories we look for in spiritual maturity. Not just the knowledge, not just how old we are. That will really cut to the chase. Now, if you're, if you're selecting a pastoral candidate for a church, how do you find out those things? How do you see spiritual fruit on a resume? It makes, it makes it really challenging, doesn't it? More could be said. It is sadly true that not all spiritually gifted believers act and react in a mature way. It is sadly true that not all spiritually gifted believers act and react in a mature way. I need to remember this, don't I? Immaturity. I'm going to run through a list somewhat quickly, so bear with me. And hey, if one of these rings a bell for you, jot it down. I know I'm going to move someone quickly. Hey, but hey, the first thing you need to do in, in uh, fighting immaturity is to be willing to verbalize and vocalize the things in our life that we're actually still immature in. That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? To admit we're immature in certain areas. But find a Christian mentor, Christian mature person, perhaps your spouse, but also your spouse, and tell them, hey, I need to grow in this area. Now, men, we're never wrong, are we? We never have to ask for directions because we don't need them. It's just not necessary because we know where we're going everywhere, all points on planet Earth, right? No. So, hey, wouldn't you... Do you think your spouse is going to respect you more or less if you admit the areas in your life you need to grow? You are not mature in that area? Do you not think that person already... <laughs> do you think that's going to be a news flash to them? <laughs> I didn't know. No, everyone around us, oftentimes we can't see it so well, but the people around us see it pretty good. Are we making it possible for them to actually speak into our lives? I tell you the truth, they will respect you more respect you more. And guess what? You call it out. Guess what they're going to do when they start to see growth in your life? They're going to encourage you and they're going to tell you, hey, that area you confessed months back, years back, I see growth in your life on that. Isn't that going to encourage you? Don't you want that to be the case? That is God's design, his beautiful design in how Christian community is supposed to work. And that includes the home and especially includes the church. So immaturity is this, taking things personally. Taking things personally. Um, if Jesus took things personally, he never would have left heaven. Or as soon as he got here, five minutes later, he would have gone back. Right? Uh, immaturity is, means holding grudges. If Jesus held a grudge, he never would have got up on that cross. How many days in ministry would he have made it before he would have gone right back to heaven? <laughs> Short ministry. <laughs> and we'd still be lost in our sins. Right? Right? He's like, Holy Spirit, how dare you leave me out into the wilderness to be tempted by this, leave me without food for 40 days and be tempted by the devil himself. I can't even believe you did that. Isn't that what happened immediately after the baptism of Jesus Christ? Couldn't Jesus have held a grudge for that? What is going on? I didn't know serving God meant no water and no food for 40 days. Holding grudges is immaturity. Can we just admit that? And it's so easy to talk about, but in the moment to practice letting those things go or talking it out with the person. That's hard, isn't it? But guess what? That hardness is a good thing because it will develop maturity in your life when you follow through, when you're more driven by principle, when you're more driven by truth than you are by emotion. Immaturity makes the church responsible for your spiritual growth. Immaturity makes the church responsible. Hey, the church isn't doing a good job, therefore I can sit back and do nothing and, and stay in my immaturity because they're not doing their job. Are we going to be able to point to anybody else on Judgment Day when we stand before Jesus Christ and said, their fault, they made me do it? What about people like the pastor? Can you point to him? I mean, he's, it's his, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Or can, can wives point to their husbands? Or can husbands point to their wives? Or can we point to our parents? Or Is there anybody that's going to legitimately be able to point to and say, hey, I couldn't help it. We're each responsible for our own growth as adults. Thinking your environment has, has to be a certain way in order for you to thrive. Could Paul, the Apostle Paul thrive in a prison cell? Not a modern day prison cell, but an ancient world prison cell without all the modern conveniences. Thinking your environment has to be a certain way for you to thrive. Man, I thought that was so true. Um, all I could see was the reasons why I was stuck where I was at. 
And my dad so patiently counseled me over time to finally realize, Timothy, it's not your circumstances, it's you. And God has graciously placed those circumstances that look like they're blocking you in your life so that you can overcome them and develop maturity. Because did you remember, Timothy, your maturity was put on pause for seven years. That is why when I began to follow Jesus, things got so hard. It wasn't God was punishing me in so much that the enemy was coming after me. It was that God placed those hardnesses in my life to make up for all that time I had lost because he loved me. Can we see these hard things as opportunities, not as God beating us up or holding us down or holding us back? Happiness means the acquisition of things. The more things I have, the more happy I will be. Immaturity says, I'm unique and no one else has my struggles. Is that one true? I'm unique. We're all snowflakes, right? Um, Paul says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. I'm the exception to orthodox and standard Christianity. I'm the exception to standard or orthodox Christianity. That means, hey, the things that Jesus commanded in, uh, in, once from the church, the people in the church, those, hey, I'm the exception. Those are for all the normal Christians that really don't have the enlightened understanding or illuminated understanding that I have from my many years with Jesus reading the Bible. Is that true? Is that maturity or immaturity? Are we, can we be the exception? Are you still thinking this through? Let me just answer that for you. No, that's immaturity, okay? Just so you know. Are you guys with me? I, I like feedback. Um, thinking God works on your timing. That's, <laughs> God is doing his own thing. Let me just tell you. He dwells outside of time and space. He is never in a hurry, but he's always on time. Someone pointed this out to me when I first started. I was, I was running around, crazy person. And they say, hey, was Jesus ever in a hurry? I'm like, oh. <laughs> Thinking God works on your timing. Hey, jumping to conclusions. What I've learned in ministry is you may have an intuition. You may suspect something, but you can't act on it co- until you have concrete evidence. And oftentimes when you get evidence um, or if, if you talk to the person, you will find out there's way more to the story than what you had in your narrow pinhole perspective in, when you're jumping to conclusions. That's immaturity. Um, needing others to validate your sense of self-worth, the only person that's going to validate your sense of self-worth ultimately is God himself. He designed it that way. You need him to validate. When he validates you and he sets his affection on you, everything else is good. Serving... For the praise of people and getting angry when you don't do it. Is that maturity or immaturity? It's immaturity. Hey, I want to sign up for this ministry. Hey, no one noticed I did that ministry. No one noticed that I did all those things. No one even appreciated it. Well, who were you doing it for? Did he see it? Did he already express a lot of gratitude by getting up on a cross? Okay, we're good. All right? It doesn't matter. We're not doing it ultimately for each other. Ultimately, we're doing it for him, and that's what brings stability to our church. Cutting yourselves off from your mentor, and instead you prefer the company of those complicit with your apathy. Cutting yourselves off from people that would challenge you and purposely hanging out with people that will be okay with where you're at in your immaturity. That's immaturity itself. You need both, by the way. Well, actually, you need three. You need people that are more wise, just as wise, and less wise than you to be hanging out with. You need to be discipled, and you need to disciple others. That's how it works. We're all in this together. Thinking the voices in your head are the Holy Spirit. How about that one? They did this, there's this video my wife was showing me where they blindfolded all these little precious children, and they had them go down a row of mothers, and they, the, the child would, would feel the clothing and feel the skin and feel the faces and feel around the neck. And the child could always recognize their mom. And then when they, found, he, when they found the mom, they would get all happy, like, that's my mommy. And they would take the blindfold off and they would embrace. That child knew their mother. And Jesus says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And we, if we're going to grow in our maturity, we've got to learn to know the difference between just the voices in our head, whether they're from our fallen nature or from the enemy, and the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
And the voice of the Holy Spirit is never going to ask you to do something that contradicts what he said in his word. Some of us, in order to get that maturity, are going to have to get in the word more so we can call that out. Hey, that's just my fallen nature. That's just the enemy. That's a lie, and that's a deception, and I'm not going to be deceived. I'm going to resist it. Jumping into ministry before counting the cost. Making decisions, but you can't keep them, and you complain about what you committed to. Getting easily distracted from your mission. You start things, but you don't finish due to neglect or forgetfulness. You force others to walk on eggshells around you lest they, uh, they, you be offended. Certain topics are passively declared off limits. You stay on the outskirts or the periphery of community lest you experience accountability. You define the church as a loose connection of Christian acquaintances in order to avoid accountability. Immature Christians are their own pastors and deacons to themselves. The essence of, the, one of the primary litmus tests of being a Christian mature is a Christian mature uh, person serves other people, is a deacon to others. So I'll say that one again. Immature Christians are their own pastors and deacons to themselves. Immature Christians claim revelation from the Holy Spirit that is contrary to revelation from Scripture. Immature Christians talk about the person instead of going to the person. Are any of these helpful or is this really discouraging? Can we go home now? I just feel beat up. Hey, hey we're, you're, if you're mature this morning, and we all are, you're not alone. The question is, do you want to stay there? That's the question. We all always will always have room to grow until we see Jesus face to face. And then I'm not sure what's going to happen. How that's going to work exactly? First John three two. Mature. What does a mature Christian look like? And we'll just have a little bit more time, so I'll run these some, somewhat quickly. A spiritually growing person is not someone who repents less and less, but a spiritually mature person is somebody who repents more and more and more and more quickly, more genuinely, and is more sorry for the sin from the heart than just being sorry for the consequence of the sin. I'm not, I'm not just sorry I got caught. I'm sorry that I sinned. I'm sorry I sinned against you, Lord. That's Christian maturity. A spiritually mature person is someone that when you criticize them, hear this one, when you criticize them, and even if your criticism is half wrong, they take the part that's half right, and they say, I think you have a point. That's a hard one, isn't it? You get, you get that? They're looking for the ways they can grow. A spiritually mature person can grow from someone who knows far less than them. The thing I like to tell myself is, if Solomon can learn from an ant, who can I not learn from? I can always learn something from anybody, no matter where they're at in their, in their Christian walk. A spiritually mature person is someone who is quick to admit they are wrong. Amen. That's maturity right there. And it's a beautiful thing. And guess what? When a mature person is around and they're quick to admit they're wrong, guess what happens? Trickle-down effect, domino effect, other people begin to feel the liberty and freedom to admit they're wrong too. And then through that admission that you're wrong, you begin to exercise leadership around you. And you begin to change the culture of your family and of your church. So I want to say, I said this briefly last week, I just want you to know the essential property to growth in maturity is the willingness and ability to make personal sacrifices over time. The essential property to growth in spiritual maturity is the willingness and ability to make personal sacrifices over time. Immaturity says, oh, it just got hard, I quit. Oh, it just got hard. Let's do something else. Oh, it's just got hard. Let's hit the pause button. It's, it's, you can't get away from it, okay? And that is true for also climbing out of, of poverty, as we uh, mentioned briefly last week. Mature Christians let Jesus reign in every area of their lives. Immature Christians compartmentalize and give him only sections while seeking to be their own God in every other area. They make Jesus not king of their life, but merely a figurehead with no real power. They don't submit to his will, they submit to their own will. Your own will will leave you 
in immaturity. Mature Christians are marked by humility. Mature Christians not only know God's word, but they apply God's word beginning with themselves. And mature Christians live to serve others. Mature Christians love people who don't yet love Jesus. Crucial. Mature Christians are able to learn from people who are less mature than they are. Mature Christians set out and live out personal standards, personal standards that are higher for themselves than they are for other people. Mature Christians seek out the truth for the purpose of repentance and change. Mature Christians seek out discipleship, accountability, transparency. Mature Christians make wise commitments and follow through with them over time. I'm almost finished. Mature Christians take initiative in serving and meeting the needs of others. Mature Christians submit plans to wise leadership for confirmation. Mature Christians understand the needs of the many are greater than personal preferences. Mature Christians often serve outside their comfort zone. Mature Christians seek out and submit to the, to the Spirit-ordained leadership as a means of submitting to God's Word, as a means of submitting to King Jesus. That was pretty fast, right? Yeah. So we're going to have community group, <laughs> and uh, we're going to encourage one another, and we'll, we'll, we'll go back over some of these and ask some application questions. But again, the purpose of teaching and understanding these things of, is to be equipped Equipped to use your spiritual gifts, resulting in the building up of the church and growth and maturity. And we're going to talk a little bit more next week about spiritual gifts and their exercise. Because some of you may not yet know what your spiritual gift is and the result is. In some sense, the church has taken a hit because we need you. God has a special mission for you to build up the church. And that includes people who are not yet part of the church. So we'll talk more about that next week. But... um, can I just say, even this year, my wife um, is coming to me and saying, hey, Timothy, I really see you're growing in this area. You're really growing in, in uh, your maturity in this way. And you know what it was for me? Uh, when I first started dating my wife, um, you know what I would do? I, remember I said I spent seven years away from God? You know what, what was the pattern there? Is when trials and trouble would come, I would just run. And that meant leaving my parents' house. That meant leaving my parents' city. That finally meant leaving my, uh, the state my parents lived in. And ultimately, it le- meant leaving the country my parents lived in because I would run. And that's running pretty far, right? Thousands of miles to get away. But when I started dating my wife, my wife had to see me fly off the handle with people. And that meant she often had to see me go back and ask forgiveness from people. And can I just say... This pursuit of maturity that happened, started way back then, is, is even now bearing fruit in my life. Can I just say, testify, is that God has done such an amazing work in my marriage this last year. Amen. And even the last six months, even the last four months, even the last two months, it is, it is, it is just amazing. And it's because it's you pursuing God, that pursuit of God flows out into your relationships. And for for my wife to be able to see that I don't fly off the handle like I used to, I don't lose my temper like I used to, and I'm more patient and more gentle and more kind, and she's seen actually preaching through the book of Ephesians affect my life and affect my heart and affect my patterns of behavior, do you not know that one of the results of that was my wife and I are much closer together? And that's something, that's another one of those intangible things that I can describe an amazing marriage, but until you're really experiencing it, you don't know what you're missing. And here in this lies the, the idea that God has all these things he wants to bless us with, and we stand back and we're skeptical. It's like, is that really going to be as good as you say it is? Isn't what the world has to offer so much better? And can I tell you from having just come this far, and I have further to go as a 40-year-old man who's been married going on 13 years, that it is amazing what God has planned for us. Amen. And I wouldn't trade it. And so it comes down to this. Are you willing to call out the areas in your life where you're immature? Are you willing to call it out? Are you willing to, to let a mature Christian speak into your life and advise you where you need to grow in maturity? Are you willing to struggle against the areas in your life where you are immature and begin to respond in different ways than you did in the past? You say, this is the way I always respond. Wait, right at this moment is when I fly off the handle. Wait, no, not doing that. 
I got a higher purpose. I, I want God to demonstrate his power, the Holy Spirit power in my life right now. And I'm just going to stop. This is right where I lose it. You know how those, those thoughts, of those, uh, those patterns of behavior start to manifest themselves in your mind? Can you catch it right there at that moment? Don't wait till after the fact and you have to pick up the phone and apologize or go face to face and apologize like I did. Just catch it right there with that pattern of behavior and, and nip it in the bud right there. Get to prayer. Get in the word. Get around Christians that will encourage you. Finally, are you willing to ask forgiveness from God and from those you have been, who have been on the receiving end of your immaturity? One of the reasons why that motivated me not to lose my temper is I got tired of having to ask people for forgiveness. And one of the ways you start to turn this thing around is you go back to the people in your life you've sinned against that have been the receiving end of your immaturity and you get that thing right. And God blesses that. What a beautiful thing for all of us, no matter where we're at in our Christian life, for this year, 2016, to grow in our maturity. And I really believe it's not until we begin as a whole church to be grow in our maturity that God is going to be able to entrust us with more souls, with more disciples. Because if we can't grow ourselves and, we, and our, we're not going anywhere spiritually, then why would God entrust us with people like where do we have to lead them to? You see how that works? Maturity is a beautiful thing. I just want to pray in closing. I just invite the worship team to come up, and I just want to pray a blessing on all of us as we uh, go back to wor- uh, worship and song. Father, thank you that you have all these amazing plans for us. Thank you that your ways are higher than our ways. And Lord, I just want to ask forgiveness uh, corporately for, for all the ways that we've uh, grieved your Holy Spirit. We've quenched your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that I can come before you boldly, before your throne, and ask forgiveness because you already made all preparation for you to be able to forgive based on what you did on the cross, your death, your burial, your resurrection. And Lord, you stand at the door and knock, and you are so patient with us. And I pray that we would be illuminated again in our hearts and our minds as to where specifically you would have us to grow in our maturity. And Lord, lead us on the path of righteousness. May we remain teachable, humble people that perpetually are growing in our maturity. Lord, bless us in this this year. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen.